again for taking out time and I hope you all had a lunch. Let me just quickly introduce myself. My name is Manminder Singh and I'm the solution consultant with Adobe, specifically focusing upon Adobe RoboHealth. And essentially what I and me and Bharat, we as a team, we help organizations to identify what solutions fit the best based on the requirements that they have. Right now, I happen to be a part of a couple of conferences wherein we have been able to you know, help customers to identify and you know, the problem areas that they had in their organization and how our solutions would help them fulfill or get rid of the problems that they are facing using our solutions. So you can get connected with me on the preferred LinkedIn URL that is provided on the PowerPoint. Now talking about this session today, this session is going to be more focused upon how can you deliver an immersive user experience to all your users, uh, creating documentation in Adobe RoboHealth. Then I would also be focusing upon what are the new areas, what are the new things that we have come up in the latest release, that's Adobe RoboHealth 2017. And then I would be focusing more about how you could bring a personal touch to the content, what are the elements that you could integrate in your documentation to make your content much more personalized, customized, and fulfill the requirements that your users come across while they are going through your documentation. And lastly, I would be also focusing upon the analytics part, wherein you could see how your content is getting consumed. And, okay, so what's, the, this is the next one, right? How your content is getting consumed, and who are consuming it, and how you could optimize your content basis, the consumption that you get for the content. Now, a quick hand raise would help me out in order to identify or get a sense of what kind of people we have. I do see that there are a couple of FameMaker folks who are already using, but anyone who is planning to get started with technical documentation using Adobe RoboHelp or Adobe FameMaker are probably using Word right now. Okay. Just one, two, so on. And how many of you are already using RoboHelp? Okay. And if I may ask, what version would that be? 2015. Now, how many of you have seen RoboHelp? Okay, so pretty much everybody started with RoboHelp, now they are on to FrameMaker. But nevertheless, you know, we come across various organizations wherein we see that there, is, there are hybrid teams within the organization. We see that not everybody is capable in order to get started with FrameMaker at the very first moment. Essentially, that's the area wherein we see that organization adapt and hybrid approach, wherein there are some users who are on Word. There are some users who are doing some unstructured authoring using solutions like Adobe RoboHelp and many more that are available in the market. And then there is a segment of a team that is more specialized and focused upon the structured documentation. Now, there could be several reasons why organizations take this kind of an approach. One of the, uh, one of the uh, reasons would be that how easily and how quickly you could make your content available to the right set of people at the right time. Because when you go ahead and when you get started with a solution like Adobe FrameMaker, you have to have an expertise or you have to get a gist of what all terminologies that have been used and how you could get started with it. Specifically talking about RoboHelp, it's a solution that allows you to create almost any kind of documentation. Most of the people believe that it's still something that focuses upon knowledge bases. But over the period of time, I've seen organizations leveraging it for creating, help, uh, I would say, policies and procedures documentation that is available either on the printed format or even on the online format. So in a nutshell, this is what Adobe RoboHelp is. It helps you create a content that could be delivered across multiple devices, be it large screen desktops or the small screen mobile phones. Any content that you design is scalable and adaptable on these devices. Users get to have a similar kind of experience irrespective of what kind of screen size that they are using. Now, when I talk about RoboHelp, these are some of the quick examples that come into my mind, and this is something that maybe the people who are within your team who are still holding on to Word, and they would want to upskill themselves, and they would want to get started with and contribute to the content, maybe instead of you transforming that content, 
you could probably go ahead and help your users to you know get adapted to RoboHelp and maybe collaborate the content that exists in both RoboHelp as well as in FrameMaker. So you could create a content that is relevant to the set of users that you have, which would help them out in order to find the content in a much less amount of time using the different kinds of capabilities that we have introduced in both RoboHelp as well as FrameMaker, which is the autocomplete search, dynamic content filters, and so on. Now, content that you create can be delivered across any device, be it in form of responsive HTML5 or even the mobile apps. Now, I see that there is an adaption of the mobile apps across the organization when we are dealing with people who are in the field or maybe in a restricted environment or maybe they are using mobile, app, uh, mobile devices or the organizations who are more focused on the mobile applications wherein they would want some help that their customers or their users could download and they could even access the same in the offline mode. Now this is one thing that is very well known for context sensitive help, right? A help that you could create for online, offline access. If you are working in a restricted environment, probably you could come up with a context sensitive help which is more focused towards Microsoft HTML help, also known as CHUM, right? And also, you could also use it in the form of responsive HTML5. So we see organization using multiple approaches, and this is one of the approach that we have even taken out with our product. So if, let's say, today somebody plans to use RoboHelp or FrameMaker, right? Somebody might have an access to the internet, or there would be some people who don't, right? So for such documentation, if the user gets to access the context-sensitive help, by just simply pressing an F1, they would get an access to the online version of your documentation, which is more updated. So if you're dealing with an application manual, right, or an application help, every now and then you are coming up with new releases. How can you provide that new updates? So an online context-sensitive help answers that question. Then again, you are working if in an offline environment, people use the chum in order to create a context-sensitive. And then there is a standalone help, which is more like in the form of a website wherein the users could go, they can access your documentation, more like a separate help that is provided along with the product. Now, probably I'll just skip this part. And talking about some of the samples created for this session, you would be able to download these samples by going on to these links provided in the PowerPoint. Now, talking about the latest things and the new things that we came up with, RoboHelp 2017. So, most of you who have used Word in the past, you would have gone through several challenges in order to find and locate the menus or the options where, it, where they are. It's very hard to remember when you have too many options available. So what we want you to do is, we don't want you to change who you are, right? We want you to be more of who you are. Instead of, so if you are already using Word or any existing product along with uh, when you are creating a documentation. One thing that you would find similar in RoboHelp now is that you have a ribbon-based UI in RoboHelp 2017, which is somewhat identical to what you get in Word nowadays. So it's much more easier for you to find, locate the options, and the tabs that you would find are much more similar to what you have in Word, be it in terms of insert, collaborate, review, and so on. The next thing that I would want to focus on is you can almost use or reuse any type of content. So with some solutions, there are restrictions wherein you could only use PDFs or you could only use Word. But if I talk about RoboHelp, you have the capability to leverage almost any type of content, be it in the form of XML, be it in the form of data, be it in the form of even the Captivate files. I'm not sure how many of you are aware of Captivate. So it's one of the solutions that allows you to create a simulated environment when you are dealing with the product help manuals, wherein you could integrate those manuals into your RoboHelp project. So these are some of the different kinds of, I would say, formats that you could directly ingest into your RoboHelp project. And the next thing that I would want to focus upon is the single sourcing aspect. Now, we deal with multiple clients, multiple user sets, right? It becomes difficult for us to maintain and manage different forms of documentation. So using conditional build tags in RoboHelp would allow you 
to segregate your content in such a way or maybe mark your content in such a way that it's easier for you to identify as in what content belongs to what user set. Which in turn, so that you are able to manage all the content in one place and you are able to deliver it across to all the different kind of audience that you are planning to target. Now, I'll show you a quick sneak peek of how we have revamped the UI of Robo Help 2017, how it actually functions, and what are the other things that we have added on the top of it. So let me just quickly switch on to Adobe Robo Help. Let's stick some to this. Now, when I talk about Adobe RoboHelp, like I said, so you would find, so I'm just going to name it as RHIDF. There are various changes that you would find in the latest version, wherein the UI is completely revamped. It's much more vibrant. It's much more colorful, so that you get a hold of the application. You are able to work on the different aspects of what you wanted to use before and were hard to find. So this is how the UI of RoboHelp looks like. So it's completely customizable. You have the similar concept of pods, again, that is available. On the top, you could easily identify the different kinds of options provided under the logical order in the tabs that are provided. You could change the color themes, how the UI for RoboHelp should look like. You also have an access to a quick access toolbar. So anything that you are using quite often, some, key, uh, some particular functionalities that you want just at your fingertips, you have the option to add them in the quick access toolbar as well, just like in Word. So when you would want to easily transition from the existing platform to Adobe RoboHelp, it's with the help of ribbon-based UI, it's much more easier and it's much more quicker. Now, when I talk about reusing any type of existing content, so like I said, there are different kinds of formats that are supported. And you can import all these formats right into RoboHelp at any point of time. So I'll just quickly go ahead and I'll show you how you, and I'll just quickly. So this is one of the files that I would want to import. Now, during the course, when you are importing, you have the capability to map your styles with what you have in Word. And also, you have the capability to paginate or split your document into multiple topics. Yes? Okay, so let me just try to change the display settings a bit. Is that readable now? OK. So any content that you have, you should be able to bring that into RoboHelp. And it just not has to be only the content that comprises of Word documents, but you also have the option to import almost any kind of documentation. So let's say if I would want to import any content right now, I could just simply go to that respective now, what kind of content, how the content should look like, I can map it to the styles of RoboHelp. And once that is done, I can simply include all the additional elements that I have. So if I have existing table of contents, indexes, glossary, I can bring that right into RoboHelp. So this is how quickly and easily you could transform any kind of documentation that you have. So be it in terms of you know, some documents that you have in Word, or maybe in FrameMaker, and so on. Now, when we are dealing with such documents, right, it becomes difficult for us to segregate the content and ensure what content belongs to what kind of audience. For that, there is something similar to what you find in FrameMaker. That's called conditional build tags, which helps you categorize your content. Now, there are various ways that I see organizations using it. One way is that we as an author, we take a decision that this is the content what our audience is supposed to see. So that not everybody gets to get an access to that content, which is more like achievable using conditional build tags. 
The other way that organizations approach is that if, let's say, this content is to be consumed by the people who are within the organization, maybe I don't have to worry about the confidential aspect of it, how secure my content is, or maybe the people from different department, and it's for all the departments. So for that, you could again leverage the same conditionable tags in the form of dynamic content filters and give your users the capability to make the decision as per their choice. Now, talking about any content that I had in Word, all that content is now imported into RoboHelp, so it generated all, um, I would say, the table of contents that I had in Word document. Now, once that content is imported by just simply creating few tags, I could specify as in what content is to be viewed by what kind of audience. So let's say I'm just gonna say that there are a couple of user groups that I would be targeting, maybe a user group A or user group B. So I would just specify whether what kind of content to be viewed by user group A or a user group B. Now, conditionable tags, when we used to deal with it, we were able to apply the tags onto the content. You also have the capability to get into much more detail or much more depth of the content wherein you could specify the tags, not only just on the content that you are using within the topics, but also the content that you have residing in the tables, images, and almost any kind of object that you have used within your content. So you could specify as in what type of content is to be viewed by what kind of audience. So let's say, if I have some tables, probably this is the section which I would want to be viewed by my user group A. So I could just pick and choose, and I could drop as in what is to be viewed by user group A, and what is to be viewed by user group B. Now once that is specified, I could also specify the same thing at the topic level. So what belongs to user group B? And also I could specify it at the book level. So whether what type of content they could access. Now similarly, I'm just gonna do the same thing for the different user group as well, so that it's easier for us to identify as in what content is to be viewed by what kind of audience. Now, in the conditional build section, there are some enhancements that you would notice, right? Uh, any content that you are marking as a condition in Adobe RoboHill. So earlier, we had to come up with a concept of logics and expressions, wherein you know we have to specify as in this particular content is to be viewed by this audience and so on. So for that, any content that you mark, so let's say I'm just gonna say, I'm just gonna use a couple of layouts. So let's say this is the layout that I would be using. Now within this, I can say that what content is meant for audience or user group A should be made available. Now according to this, once I do that, there is one thing that you would notice that it automatically creates an expression as in what to be viewed by whom. Now, ideally, when we deal with such content, uh, there are too many, I would say, user groups that are involved in this process, and this conditional build expression goes to a huge length. So what you could do is, instead of identifying that, you know, whether what kind of audience this is meant for, you could quickly name it as, let's say, for user group A. So you could specify or provide a naming convention for the expression that has been built so that it's easier for you to identify. Now once that is done, the content that I generate is gonna be for my user group A. The next thing that I would want to focus upon is, let me just quickly switch on to. Now this is one of the things that we came up with and that's what I would say the RoboHelp 2017 release is majorly focused upon. Uh, this is essentially one of the major factors what RoboHelp does. So any content that you have, you have the capability to publish it across multiple channels, be it responsive HTML5. So anything that you are generating, same could be generated in responsive HTML5, PDFs, Word documents, XML, 
or even the mobile apps. So by default, you have the capability to generate a mobile app right out of the box. You don't have to do any sort of coding. And this is one of the things that it's more focused upon. So this is something that we've been focusing since RoboHelp 2015 release. How can you personalize the experience for your audience? Right? We have a content that is so huge that comprises of so many pages, so many topics. Right? How is it even helpful for our audience? How is it you know, even serving our audience? When we used to deal with such documentation in the past, right, it was so difficult for us to identify what information to access, whether if it's right or not, and whether if it's something to be meant for me or not. Now, on those same lines, you would find that there are some many more organizations who are on the same lines, and maybe this is something that we see day in, day out when we are using some of the services like Google how quickly and easily we could find the content. Google comprises of so many documentation that you could find. What documentation is right? What kind of information exists on the internet? The next thing that it helps you with is, it helps you see the scope of the search, the scope of information that is available on the internet. It suggests you, it helps you to identify whether what information exists and what is it that you could look for. And when I talk about personalization, this is again one of the biggest examples that we come across as I believe all of us in the room, we believe in e-shopping, right? And when it's, when it's time for shopping, we actually look for the products that is actually meant for us. Maybe the brands, maybe some kind of configurations that we are looking for on the internet. So a quick example that gives you the idea how organizations are doing it. And this is one of a kind of an approach that you could also bring to your documentation, helping your users identify what is it that they would want to find in your documentation. Now, this could be something pertaining to their role, pertaining to their profile, pertaining to their department, and so on. Now, the similar kind of concept has been used in RoboHelp and FrameMaker as well. So with the new releases, uh, you have a concept of frameless and search-driven help documentation, or maybe a documentation that you would want to create. In fact, this was, I would say, one of the key things that was desired by most of the audience. We don't want to have a traditional layout, a tripane structure which comprises of uh, the banner on the top, TOC on the left, and the content on the right-hand side. In order to customize this, we had to go through or deal with the coding aspect of our documentation. However, it was still unachievable due to several reasons. Either we did not have resources who had an expertise on such technologies, or we had a dependency on some other people to help us out with this thing. But yet, the end result that we achieved in order to make those customizations was still not as per the goal that we had in mind. When I talk about this, this is something that is provided to you right out of the box within Adobe RoboHelp and FrameMaker. The layouts are customizable. There are some default set of options that we are providing you, but we have seen customers building something on the top of it and coming up with their own skins and own layouts. Maybe the layouts that fit or match your branding requirements that you have in your organization. Predictive search. Now this again, so I was hearing a lot about, you know, maybe if we could have a voice search uh, in the documentation. I would say the way we are evolving, maybe there would be some point in time wherein we would have that kind of capability. But if I talk about this search that you see on my screen, this is also based on natural language processing. So what it actually does is it's one of the concepts that has been used by most of the search engines so to help them there is an algorithm that is used which could predict as in what the user would want to see. Basis that, the user is provided with the results. It auto-corrects them. There are some, so many technical jargons that we have in our organization. Maybe a new joinee who just joined in, he's not aware what term they should look for. Right? So it would auto-correct them. It would show them as in what is there, what is not, and what is the scope. Now, even though we have a documentation that ranges from like thousands to thousand pages, still there are situations wherein the users are unable to find out the results. Maybe they are using wrong keywords, or maybe they are using some other jargons. 
Now, when we are dealing with such situations, this is something that is extremely helpful to help them out as in what kind of information exists within the documentation. Dynamic content filtering. This is something that you could have or you could customize as per your requirements. This is the job profiles, the departments. So using the same conditions that you build, you can leverage these filters that are pertained to those dynamic filters, uh, I would say uh, conditions that you are using, and basis that the results are provided to your users. So this is something that is applicable on both search, on I would say topic content, table of contents, anything that the users select would get filtered out. So if you imagine a search, a keyword, let's say there is a keyword that come across or is used in 1,000 pages, right? And if I search for that same keyword, I would come up with 1,000 results, right? Happens with all of us. In order to avoid that situation, let's say if that keyword, I would want to use it for 